Good morning, everybody. Running a little late today, but uh, we're back here. Uh, good to have you with us this morning, and welcome once again to our Friday edition of our 9 o'clock prayer today. <coughs> Excuse me. On the way to church this morning, the Lord's kind of just dealing with me. A lot of us have uh, a lot of things going on in our lives, and there's a lot of there's a lot of pain, and there seems to be like a whole lot of death going around. So uh, today, uh, if you got your Bible, turn with me to Job chapter two. Job chapter two. We're going to start verse eleven and read through thirteen. Job chapter two. Let's pray, dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, in Jesus' name, I just want to praise you and thank you, Lord God, again for for all that you do for me and do for us, Lord God, do for all of us, Lord. We pray, Lord God, this morning to bless our prayer lesson. Lord God, give us hearts and minds ready to receive it, Lord God. And we thank you, Lord, for your mercy and for your kindness, Lord. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Job chapter 2, verse 11. Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that was come upon him, they came every one from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Nahiamite, for they had an appointment together to come to mourn with him and to comfort him. And when they lifted up their eyes afar off and knew him not, they lifted up their voice and wept, and they rent every one his mantle, and sprinkled dust upon their heads toward heaven. So they sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights, and none spake a word unto him, for they saw that his grief was very great. Amen. Come on, Sister Cindy, Brother Jared. Here, Job lost everything. He lost his camels. He lost his all, all of his animals, his sheep, his camels, his donkeys. He lost all of his children, all in a single day. And if you read chapter 1, how people were waiting in line to give him bad news. Good morning, Sister Bonnie. They were waiting in line to give him bad news. So when Job's friends heard about it, they came running to him and said, Man, that dude's just tore up from the floor. Let's go see if we can help and comfort him. So they ran in every place, and when they saw him, they didn't even recognize him because of the grief that Job was under. Even though Job says here in um, uh, chapter 20, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 21, he said, The good Lord gave, and the good Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You see, Job recognized that God was still God even if he didn't have any stuff. But now the his flesh is... Uh, we would know how we feel if we lose a child. You lose one of your children. You can imagine losing all of your children all at once. I remember when I was... Uh, well, I was two. 1970. I had two brothers that drowned. One died trying to save another. And up to the day my mama passed away, she never got over it. She was grieved and burdened. And here Job lost all of his children. And if his friends came and saw that he was just overwhelmed with grief. What do you tell somebody like that? What words can help a person who's dealing with that type of loss and that type of grief? The honesty honest answer is there are no words. There is nothing you can say to somebody who is dealing with this type of grief and they don't need your pity. What they need is our prayers. His friends were there to comfort and to help them but they knew there was nothing they could say. There's no words that they could offer that would make Job feel better. But they knew that their company would help. Old saying is that misery loves company. Sometimes you just don't have to say a single word. You just need to be there for somebody. You just need to show up. I remember when my mom passed away. I have all these people who had saved her. They were my friends and that they really cared about me. There was only two of them that actually showed up at my mom's funeral to actually show that they actually cared how I was feeling. And that meant the world to me. Not that they said anything. It was just them being there. Just them sharing my grief for just a moment meant the world to me. 
Now, as a preacher, you try to find right words. You try to find something or say something that might help. And Ecclesiastes chapter 12, it says, The preacher sought to find out acceptable words. And that which was written was upright, even words of truth. He tried to seek good words. In Isaiah chapter 50, verse number 4, it says, The Lord hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to them that, are weary, that is weary. And you try, through, through my past experience, the things that I've had to deal with in my loss, what helped me was not just them showing up, but someone who can actually empathize with my situation. My, my point being, if, if you've lost somebody, if you lost a mom, you lost a dad, you lost a son or a daughter, you lost a brother or a sister, you, lost, you, had, you suffered some kind of loss in your life, and then you see someone who just had the exact same loss that you have, you can go to that person you said, I know exactly what you're going through because I've been through it myself and you will get through this and I'll be here to help you. Those are the best words that you could say to help somebody. Because, you know, the funeral, when somebody dies, you know, the, the days leading up to the funeral and the day before and the day after, you know, there's company. But it's the week follows and the couple weeks following that when nobody's there and you're dealing with that loss all by yourself. That's when it really just starts to hit home. And that's when people really need a follow-up visit. Where they need somebody to show up and say, I know you're dealing with the loss and all the company is gone, but I want you to know that I'm still thinking about you. I'm still thinking about you. I got you on my heart. I got you on my mind. And then we can just pray that God would give them comfort. We just pray, Lord, I, 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 I can't say I'm, I'm not the smartest person in the world, but I can be there for them. And you don't even have to ask if somebody's lost a loved one. You don't, oh, what do you need? Just bring something. Just show up. Hey, I brought you, made you this casserole. I made you this. I brought you this. Here's some fried chicken. Here, here. I just brought some paper towels and paper plates. Here, I just brought some ice and some drinks. You, you know, hey, just bring whatever you got. They don't really care what you bring. They just care that you show up. They just care that you care enough to actually show up and help. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and this is now my go-to verse when I'm dealing with with someone who has a great loss. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 3, it says, be, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Now, Paul, he says that the same God who comforts us will be the exact same God that comforts them. So we, let's pray that the Lord would give them that comfort. In, Second, in uh, Romans chapter 5, Paul writes, you know, by whom we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Now, why would someone celebrate something difficult like this? Let's read on. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience, experience, and experience, hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. Paul says, all the bad experiences that I've had to deal with in my life, and then you read this first Corinthians, second Corinthians three. He says, this, this tribulation that I went through, it gave me patience. And this patience gave me experience. And this experience gave me hope. And the exact same thing as Paul is writing there in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, the God who comforted me when I went through my tribulation, when I was patient in tribulation and I didn't get overwhelmed with this grief where I wanted to just kill myself, this God brought me through it. 
and it gave me hope, knowing that the next time I go through a difficulty, next time I deal with something, that that same God who helped me last time will help me this time. And then I can use my pain, I can use my heartache, I can use what I've been through to help someone else deal with their loss, deal with their pain. Why? Through the experience that I've had myself. And that's why he's, he can make good out of a bad situation. And it may help you heal when you help someone else heal. Amen? It may help you heal when you help someone else heal. So his three friends showed up, and they, when they lifted up their eyes afar off, they knew him not. They lifted up their voice, and they just started crying. They saw the condition of Job. His countenance was changed. His body felt like it was just crumbled. And you know when you go through some kind of heartache like that, you just change. Your whole, everything changes. Your physical appearance even changes. And they rent everyone his mantle and sprinkled dust upon their heads. What does that mean? Abraham did that in the Old Testament. Because after all, from dust we came, and to dust we shall return. Representing someone has gone. And this is what we shall all return to one day. From dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. So they sat down with him upon the ground. Seven days, seven nights. One whole solid week didn't speak a word but they were there for him and I praise the Lord that I have a lot of people who have been there for me um, just the other day I, I sent a guy a text and I apologized for something and I just left it at that and next though he showed up at my house and he said what, what's going on you okay and and that's 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 that means the world. When people care enough about you, when they feel like you're really hurt, they show up. We pray for them. And how many of us put prayer hands on Facebook and pray for me and pray for this and pray for that? When somebody's asked for prayer on Facebook, do we actually take the time to pray? Do we actually take the time and say a prayer for that person? He said, would you, all my prayer warriors, would y'all say a prayer for this person? Would y'all say a prayer for me? I actually do. This morning when I opened up before I get on here, I, I kneel and I pray myself. And I pray for all those who give me spoken requests for prayer. I pray for my son. pray for my health. I had a several prayer requests this morning before we even started prayer. People being in the hospital, having tests done. So I pray for them. Then I pray for those who raised their hands in church. I have an unspoken prayer request, and I pray for them. And then I say, Lord, remember all those who asked for prayer I may have forgotten about. Lord, then I say, Lord, all those who asked for prayer on Facebook, Lord, remember all of those. If we can just take a moment out of our busy day and pour some dust upon our heads, take a moment and start praying for those who really need it, because they don't need our pity. They do need our prayers. So let's pray. Let's pray earnestly and honestly and sincerely for those who are in desperate need of help. Those who are dealing with a tragedy, dealing with a, a, a significant loss. And when you lose a parent, it changes you. When you lose both parents, it's one of the hardest things you ever have to deal with in your life when you lose both your mom and your dad. I remember losing my mom in 2001 and I lost my dad in 2009. When my dad died, I felt like I lost my mom again. Because I had my dad to remind me of my mother. But when my dad passed, it was, it was hard. But I thank God that he is the one who brought me through. He is the one who has been with me every step of the way has never forsaken me, has never left me, has guided me, and has comforted me. In Psalms chapter 41, verse number 10, he says, Fear thou not, 
for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. And that's a powerful promise from God himself. He says, guess what? They may forget you and they may leave you. They may forsake you, but I never will. And I don't want you to be afraid of being alone because you're, you're never alone. God is with us today. Amen. When my father passed. Psalms chapter 46 was the verse, the chapter we had for prayer meeting that morning. It says, God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in time of trouble. Therefore will we not fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Though the waters there roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. He said, there is a refuge. When you're dealing with your hurt, when you're dealing with your pain, when you're dealing with your sorrow, he says, God is a refuge. When your whole world is turned upside down, God is our refuge. He says, there is a river. The streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. The holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The heathen raged, and the kingdoms removed. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he hath made in the earth. He makes wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chair in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Amen. And I read that. And these words were words of comfort. These were words of comfort and promise that God is with us today. I don't know what you're going through. I just know the Lord laid this on my heart today. So they sat down with Job for seven days and for seven nights. And none, none spake a word. But they were there. They were there for him. And I praise God that there's a lot of people who have been there for me. And a lot of you, I don't know what you're dealing with today. But you need to understand when you go through a difficulty, when you go through that valley, when you go through the... A dry spell when you're dealing with something, when you're dealing with dis discouragement, when you're dealing with despair, when you're dealing with all of these things, you need to understand that the Lord is still there. He hasn't left us, nor will he ever. Amen? Second Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not kept, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always, always, always bearing about in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life of Jesus also be made manifest in our body. That's right, Brother Jerry. I was listening to you sing that song this morning. We got to learn to lean on Jesus. Learning to lean on the Lord. Because if we try to do stuff ourselves, we will fall and we will fail. But when we're leaning on the Lord, He is the rock. 
and the rock never moves. So we can lean on the Lord and know that we're not going to fall down. We're not going to go backwards. We're not. We're going to stay right where we are, leaning on the everlasting arm. Is a song we sing, and let's learn to lean on Jesus today. That I said earlier this week, not every day in your life is going to be cupcakes and rainbows and everything's going to be beautiful and lovely. You're going to have moments of pain. You're going to have moments of heartache and despair. That's when your faith is really tested. And there's some when their faith is tested, they just kind of fizzle out. There's, there's, there's really no substance there. But those of us who really love and trust in God, that's when we lean on our faith the most. Faith is easy when you're standing on the mountain. As the song says. But when you're down in the valley, full of trial and temptation, that's when your faith is really put to the test. Job was put to the test. He grieved. He grieved. He cried. He was hurt as every one of us would be if we lost what he lost. But guess what he never did? He never charged God foolishly. His wife. And and that was just the, the, the beginning of Job's test. That wasn't the end of it. The very next chapter. You know, Job says, the good Lord gave and the good Lord take away. And the devil said, aha, that, but if you touch his body, he'll curse thee to thy face. So Job ended up getting boils all over his body. From the top of his head to the soles of his feet, there were boils all over him. Blisters all over his body. His wife looked at him and says, curse God and die. He says, you speak as a foolish woman. He says, didn't we receive good from God? Shall not also receive, receive evil. Job was tested not just with his stuff and his family, but he was tested with his own health. Yet, he never gave up on God. He even wrote this in Job chapter 23. And it's powerful. And Job's patience was tested. And as Paul was writing in Corinthians, he says this, tribulation gives us patience. Job chapter 23, but verse number 10 says, But he knoweth the way that I take. And when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot hath held his steps, and his way have I kept and not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. But he is in one mind. And who can turn him? And what his soul desireth, even that he doeth. He says, I haven't gone backwards. I haven't done anything. I haven't changed. This hasn't moved me. I'm still following God and I still love God. And that's exactly what we all should say. And he turns to the book of Acts. Paul was being threatened and people were after him and they were trying to kill him. And Verse number 24 in Acts 20, 24 said, But none of these things moved me. Neither count my life dear unto myself, so that I may finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus do testify the gospel of the grace of God. He says, none of these things even move me. This is this life. I'm just going to have to deal with it. But I know who my God is. He is my refuge and my strength. He is a very present help in the time of my trouble. So I'm going to have to lean on him. When I can't stand on my own, when I'm about to fall because of my pain, I can lean on the rock of all ages. Amen? One more place. Uh, Psalms 18. Verse 1 says, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. 
the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the name of the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. When the sorrows of death compassed me and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid, the sorrows of hell compassed me about, the snares of death prevented me. There's trying to stuff they're trying to keep me from getting where I need to be God, where I need to get with God. The sorrows of death compassed me. Job was surrounded with the sorrow of death. Verse 6 says, In my distress, in my trouble, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple. And my cry came before him, even into his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also the earth moved, and the hills were shaken, because he heard me. The Lord hears us when we pray. The Lord sees every tear that falls from our eyes. So when you're dealing with difficulty and you're dealing with sorrow, that's when you really need to be leaning on the Lord today. Amen? Amen. All right, that's all I got for today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for the uh, for your faithfulness. I really appreciate it. I hope these words help you, comfort you, guide you, encourage you today. Sister Rosalinda, good to see you. Sister Cindy, Brother Jared, uh, Sister Bonnie, Brother Stephen be on later, Sister... Uh, Becky be on later. All of you are watching later. I appreciate you joining us every day. Brother Tony, good to see you today. Everyone be blessed and good Lord willing. We'll see you tomorrow. If you have no plans for tomorrow evening, 7 o'clock here at the church, we'll be having a singing here at the church. Uh, we will be broadcasting on Facebook Live, uh, hopefully. And uh, hopefully you can be, make it 7 o'clock tomorrow night right here at the church. All right. All right. Everyone have a blessed day, and thank you for watching, and we pray that God be with you today. Everyone be blessed.